Greetings and salutations, loyal viewers who follow every single command I give them from this seat on this channel. Today, we are going to do a dive into part two of the Sam Cedar versus Destiny debate, the Citizens United portion of said debate, which, despite what people on Twitter are telling me was Sam Cedar's golden hour, was actually significantly worse than the Rittenhouse one. Now, if you want to see part one, if you want to see me go over how weaselly Sam Cedar was on that case, how he would deflect responsibility responsibility from things that he read on air and said he agreed with on air when it was convenient for him in order to get out of actually talking about the core issue of the Rittenhouse case. You can click the I card. You can go to the description. There's your part one. That's your only warning. Now we got to get into the Citizens United portion because as I said, even though this was what people said Sam Cedar did way better on, an unprepared destiny was actually making the proper arguments accidentally on these issues and Sam Cedar has no good rebuttal but before we get into this I will throw it over to my sponsor we're gonna go to that then we'll come back over here and we'll talk about it on the other side weight loss is a near universal struggle in the United States of America and one of the reasons why is because your metabolism slows down about four percent a decade after you hit the age of 20 this is one of the reasons why I recommend my secret weapon which is of course keto with justice this wonderful keto powder elevates the number of ketones in in your body which thus gives you some of the advantages of the keto diet without you actually having to be on the full keto diet i recommend it as a supplement for the diet or on its own, it helps boost your metabolism. And if you go to ketowithjustice.com, you can try this for 60 days, full money back guarantee. You can't beat that. If it doesn't work, just send it back and get your money back. If it does work, then you're awesome and you're gonna lose weight and you're gonna look fit as hell. So the portion of the debate that I'm talking about today is the Citizens United portion, which of course is the famous 2010 case that the left lit their hair on fire over. That was decided absolutely and 100% correctly. And I will get into that throughout the course of this video, but the trigger point for this was a phone call from somebody in Sam Cedar's audience discussing the case and appearing to trick Sam Cedar into biting on the premise argued by the Citizens United side without even realizing it, thus, according to Destiny, showing a lack of knowledge of the case. So you would be against advertising for a documentary that's critical of a politician? I would be against the, the advertising of a documentary? The advertising. Yeah, the advertising of a documentary. Um, would I be against the advertising of a documentary? No, you can have advertising, fine. But can you play okay, well, the documentary? The, that, that's you... Citizens United. No, that, it's that not is the Citizens advertising. United. It's literally Citizens playing United. the documentary. No, they advertisements for the documentary is what they were, is what the uh, MCC blocked or tried to stop, and they overruled it. So the First Amendment. And they expanded, they they obviously didn't um, um, uh, do it, uh, limit it to advertising of a documentary. They determined that uh, money is speech, right? And so I disagree yeah, yeah, with absolutely. that holding. Yeah, but you agree that, you just agree that it, you would be fine with spending money on advertisements for a documentary. And that's basically the main point of Citizens United. So you told me you disagreed with Citizens United, but when I asked you- I would limit the advertising United, to United, the industry United, standards so that it was not a way of skirting agreement. around the laws that I have created to uh, to to uh, stop um, dark money from supporting but, campaigns. This I mean, progressive is taking You know how, like, <laughs> like, the, like, you are so unserious about this. It is stunning. Me? Yes. You are I so serious about this. You no, would be I know okay exactly with what you're asking. But, for a documentary, but you're asking and you agree to me why am I against or in lobbying? favor of that? And that is, the, that is the facts of the case of Citizens United. I understand what the facts of the case are, but the, the ruling exceeded that case. Everyone knows that. All right. God, what an annoying way to end the week. And honestly, that's not really interesting to me. That's not the most relevant part. For a lot of people, they don't know the facts of the Citizens United case. They know the propaganda that the corporations can give unlimited money to candidates and money is speech and blah, 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 and all that untrue nonsense. The real issue at hand with Citizens United was the McCain-Feingold law. And the McCain-Feingold law was a campaign finance law. And we're going to talk specifically about the portions of it that related to independent expenditures. You see, what John McCain and Russ Feingold, the two senators of which the law is named, had in mind when they were pushing this law was they essentially wanted to stop independent people from speaking about the elections prior to an election because they thought that that would put an undue influence on the election. And by the way, 
At the time that this bill was proposed, organizations like the ACLU and other free speech organizations had sharp criticisms of the limitations that McCain and Russ Feingold wanted to put on everyday citizens and institutions when it came to campaign stuff. So issue number one with Citizens United was the fact that the law sought to re-identify all forms of advocacy as electioneering and thus heavily restrict it contrary to First Amendment standards that were previously the norm in the United States of America. It also sought to limit speech that even mentioned a candidate within a certain period of time before an election, thus labeling it under that label of electioneering. Section 201, according to the ACL's analysis of the McCain-Feingold law, talks specifically about this. It required an accelerated and expanded disclosure of funding on issue-based advocacy. Section 202, effectively criminalized issue advocacy as a prohibited contribution if it's quote-unquote coordinated, which was incredibly broadly defined, with a federal candidate. Section 203 bans issue-based advocacy completely if it's sponsored by a labor union, a corporation, including nonprofits organized in a particular case like the ACLU, the National Right to Life Committee, or Planned Parenthood, unless they are willing to obey the government's new rules, and this included other similarly organized entities. Even an individual who receives financial support from prohibited contributors, such as corporations, unions, or wealthy individuals, is also barred from engaging in electioneering communications. Now, these rules and regulations apply to not just candidates for federal office, but they apply to issue-baked advocacy, as it was not a requirement under McCain-Feingold for you to be advocating for the victory or the defeat of a specific candidate. Now, I don't know where you went to First Amendment school. I don't know where you started learning about your constitutional rights, but limiting people's ability to talk about political issues 30 days before a primary election or 60 days before a general election whenever we're talking about federal candidates would seem to run incredibly contrary to First Amendment principles. The whole point of political speech is to use that speech when it would have an impact. And if you think about the presidential election cycle in the United States of America and how long and drawn out it is, banning political speech that could be interpreted as related to issues that the candidates would deal with 30 days before a primary and 60 days before a general election essentially banned this political speech for an entire year leading up to the election of the president of the United States. What some would argue, by the way, would be the most important election that we have in our country. Now, I might dispute that, but again, this is what people argue about the importance of the presidential election. You can understand why First Amendment scholars were put off by a law that sought to explicitly prohibit those forms of speech. Now, this had nothing to to do with donating to candidates it has long been held by the court that the candidates can regulate their own campaigns but this had to do with private individuals and institutions and corporations and unions and nonprofits and whatever that would act independently talking about issues that they cared about telling you their political opinions and whether or not the congress could embolden the fec to regulate that speech on the premise that too much money was being spent on that particular speech. Now, this all came to a head during the Democratic primaries between Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama when this company, Citizens United, a production company, attempted to release Hillary the movie during the course of the Democratic primaries on an on-demand model, and they were attempting to advertise for the release of that movie in the lead-up to the Democratic primaries. The FEC said no. They tried to cut and regulate and restrict their advertisements, thus limiting who could find out about this movie, and they tried to crack down on them for the on-demand release schedule because they had issues with that too, due to the regulations under McCain-Feingold that limit what cable providers and FEC-regulated broadcast providers could actually distribute and all that. So what we ended up with was the FEC trying to restrict a documentary critical of Hillary Clinton in the lead-up to the Democratic primaries, where she ultimately ended up losing to Obama anyway, and and this is what the court had to examine. Now, I'm going to throw it over to the debate so you can hear Sam Cedar's opinion on this, and I'll break it down for you. And then the person on the phone gave you an example that was literally just walking you through like almost exactly the facts of the case. And it seemed like neither you nor your co-host could see that he was clearly walking you to the end of that. And then when you agreed that like, oh yeah, well in that case, that comedy should be able to advertise for a documentary. And then he's like, well, what's your problem? So does United, both of you like lost your mind. You're like, well, hold on, wait a second. It's totally different. It's like, well, yes, how do you not see that you're- United, Citizens United, to say that Citizens United 
the case that was decided by the Supreme Court is about that factual situation is absolutely absurd. They addressed the question that was not asked by the plaintiff as to whether there should be any restrictions on corporate electioneering in the run up to an election. And that was not even a question that was addressed. Now, remember what I just went over about how McCain-Feingold redefined electioneering to encompass almost all forms of advocacy by individuals, institutions, corporations, labor unions, nonprofits, etc. So Sam Cedar's delineation about explicit electioneering is not present in the Citizens United law. But what he's talking about really is an exemption for media to the rules, restrictions, and regulations imposed by McCain-Feingold. The question of advertising was a very narrow question as to whether Citizens United, the organization, qualified as a media company. They tried in 2004, they tried in 2004 to, to sue, uh, to, to seek uh, an injunction against uh, Michael Moore's movie. I can't remember what the name of it was. Mm -hmm. I think it was like uh, Fahrenheit 451. Okay. I think it was that. It may have been one of his others, but it was an anti-Bush film. And he was advertising it within the run-up of the election, and they, they got, tried to get the FEC to stop it. And the FEC said, no, it's okay, because he's actually a filmmaker. So Citizens United tried to do the same thing, and the FEC said, no, you're not actually, or the three-panel court, or however they adjudicate these things, uh -huh. you're not uh, uh, an actual film company. And so they, they did a couple of movies, so they could be ready for 2008, to, uh -huh. uh, or 2000, 2008, what was it, Clinton, two, uh, 20, 2008. It was, it was, it was about it. Hillary Clinton, was with it, yeah. It was about Hillary Clinton, 2008, and, um, and, that was the question that was in front of the court. They never put into their, their, the, the plaintiff's brief the, the question of whether uh, the, the McCain-Feingold or whatever the official name was of it um, was uh, legit. Whether you could stop electioneering by folks who are explicitly trying to electioneer as opposed to have an argument that they're putting out some type of media. Now, by the way, interestingly enough, Stephen, who says that he was not prepared to discuss Citizens United at this point in time with Sam Cedar, actually hits the nail on the head of the issue at hand during the course of his response to Sam Cedar, and you can hear it for yourself. I'm not saying that I'm pro Citizens United or that I think that it was a good decision. I just think it's a, it feels like a really complicated question, and I feel like whenever people bring it up, then it, it's just it's very easy. Like, oh, Citizens United is when the Supreme what? What's the complicated part of that question? Is what is a violation of the First Amendment right to advertise for stuff that might or might not be related to political campaigns and the run-up to elections? Yeah. I think that's a really complicated question. But Sam's response is to use the same exact sidestepping tactic that McCain and Feingold tried to do when they passed this into law, which is talk about this weird exemption for media companies. Yeah, but I think okay. the, I think the challenge is... The, but I think... The, the facts of the case the ch the challenge is irrelevant because the court ignored the facts of the case and went even further <laughs> to where they needed to go. And Roberts actually wanted to do the narrow uh, uh, ruling and just rule on that case. And the rest of them said, no, we're not doing that. And off to the races, he capitulated. Sure. I think the issue is figuring out what electioneering is. I think that was the complicated part of it, that what kind of media could be released prior to a run-up to an election that would be considered electioneering or not. There if somebody was, wanted to publish there it. There was an easy test for this, and that is, is the entity formed to produce media? And the way you measure that is, how much media have they put out over the course of, you want to say three years is a reasonable time prior to it, four years, five years, six years, one year, 18 months, whatever it is. And that's the way you associate, you, you determine, is this an actual media enterprise or is it not? And there's ways, you know, you could say the, the standards that you could use are arbitrary or whatnot, but that is a very easy, I, I don't, I don't question. think it's a very easy question. So what I love about this is this is supposedly, according to the people on Twitter, Sam Cedar's golden hour. This is supposedly where Sam Cedar completely destroys destiny, but he just identified the problem in his own advocacy about the federal government establishing what companies are and aren't media companies. Therefore, they can be privileged to comment in the lead up of elections versus what companies and individuals are not media companies and thus they could be heavily restricted easy test for this and that is is the entity formed to produce media and the way you measure that is how much media have they put out over the course of you want to say three years is a reasonable time prior to it four years five years six years one year 18 months whatever it is and that's the way you associate you, you determine is this an actual media enterprise 
or is it not? And there's ways, you know, you could say the, the standards that you could use are arbitrary or whatnot. This was the whole issue of the case. This was the whole reason why the Supreme Court ruled that this carve out for media made this law unworkable, untenable, and thus a direct violation of the First Amendment. And it's perfectly obvious and reasonable. If the federal government is allowed to establish who can speak, who is a designated protected media advocacy organization that is set up for the purpose of distributing distributing media and they're all good and who isn't then the federal government is effectively regulating speech also it makes no sense even with the example that sam cedar gave they tried in 2004 to to sue uh to to seek uh an injunction against uh michael moore's movie i can't remember what the name of it was mm -hmm. i think it was like uh, fahrenheit 451 okay i think it was that it may have been one of his others but it was an anti-bush film and he was advertising it within the run-up of the election, and they, they got they tried to get the FEC to stop it. And the FEC said, no, it's okay, because he's actually a filmmaker. So Citizens United tried to do the same thing, and the FEC said, no, you're not actually, or the three-panel court, or however they adjudicate these things, uh -huh. you're not. Uh, uh, an actual film company. So Sam Cedar's example right there about how Michael Moore, when he was trying to release a film critical of Bush during the 04 cycle was protected because he was an established filmmaker working with an established media company. Therefore, therefore, they are not subject to the same rules under McCain-Feingold as Citizens United is the exact problem and the exact core of the issue at hand because it is inarguable that Michael Moore is a more prominent filmmaker and he was working with a more prominent studio than was Citizens United and their little rinky-dink Hillary Clinton documentary, no matter the big money behind it. So the idea that if you, as a production company, make a movie and try to release it on your own, then you are subject to rules, regulations, and restrictions that you would not be subject to if you were a production company, you made a film, and you sold it to a major media company for distribution makes no sense at all and clearly and obviously advantages established entrenched interests over newcomers, which is not only a restriction on the freedom of speech that should have been thrown out by the Supreme Court, but it's also a giant example of corporate welfare for big established media corporations. So it's actually a corporate handout and a monopolization of content and commentary on issues and on the candidates themselves in the lead up to the election, which is insane. And you would think a progressive wouldn't be advocating for that. Well, wasn't the issue with the Citizens United was that in order to in order to give them a win on that case they basically necessarily needed to flip that bill it wouldn't they have to make a ruling on it or they could make a ruling that because they had done two movies in the run-up between 2004 and 2008 that they now qualified as a media enterprise and that they could run advertisements for their documentary about hillary clinton so the so the precedent exactly what yeah, we, do. So, so then the precedent here that you would have preferred to set is that any time a company wants to release a piece of media it has to go through the courts to make sure they have the first amendment right to do so to make sure that they're a, a valid enough media company to do it Anytime a company wants to release a, um, a piece of media 60 days before an election, that is not release, but to advertise on television, on, on, on FCC airwaves, to advertise on television an ad about that media, they need to be a legitimate media company. And how do you establish that? They had a criteria. And again, credit where credit is due because the points that I am making, the counterpoints to everything Sam Cedar brought up that he prepared for and brought up and surprised the unprepared destiny with during this conversation are all made to a certain extent by Steven during the course of this conversation. He's cutting to the heart of the issue while Sam Cedar wants to talk about exemptions and privileges for corporations while pretending he's some anti-corporate warrior. And, and Roberts was willing to say Citizens United can show their ads because they have proven just because they went into the film business, but they put out two films, they have a track record of it. I would say no one could do that. And I would say Citizens United could have done that too. But that's not what Citizens United, the case is about. The case we're talking about the we're talking about the broader implications of the case. This is what like I'm talking about the broader implication. I'm talking about the ruling in the case. The ruling in the case blew out the entire restrictions that we had on election. Hold on, I thought you said your issue wasn't the narrow ruling of the case, it was the broader implications, the broader ruling that was made no, in the no, case. No. There were broader implications of the case, but the case itself, look, there was the case that was subsidiary that went through the lower courts. And that was the question is does Citizen United qualify as a media organization because they have put out two movies? in anticipation of wanting to advertise for this anti-Hillary uh, movie. That was, the, that was the case until it got to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court does not, is not constrained by anything. And so they addressed a question that was not even brought up in the case, which is, 
is can is there any any constitutional uh, um, validity to the McCain-Feingold bill? And the answer they found was no. But no one asked that question. That was a question they posed to themselves, and they didn't need to. Now, there's a reason I wanted to highlight this specific portion of the conversation, because it shows Sam Cedar's fundamental lack of understanding of the issue at hand and of what we're talking about when it comes to this case. So right there, he said that the Supreme Court should have just ruled that Citizens United was able to put out their commercials for Hillary the movie because they had made enough films between 2004 and between the 2007 release that qualified them to be an official media company. Company, whatever whatever now hold on that exact premise as we move forward because we're going to talk about why it actually makes no sense for the court to rule that they had a criteria have they produced films in the past have they produced media in the past mm -hmm. have they had a uh, an operation where they have tried to make profit on those there's a way to establish whether you have sure. a business or not. so you so so then you're but saying that the better the better route to go would be any time any company wants to advertise on fcc airwaves 30 or 60 days depending on if it's a primary or a federal election that all of those are going to be challenged in court and then the onus is on the person trying to exercise oh, their first amendment right they need to go before court and they need to prove to some arbitrary threshold because it is going to be challenged a million different ways well hold on my company has actually produced four or five films oh, okay well what about the fact that your company was just acquired by somebody else what about the fact that your major shareholder that just bought the company 45 days ago is somebody that isn't involved in that okay well that's or whatever like there are a million different ways that, that there are a million different ways that that case could go and the idea that every single time somebody wants to advertise about a political issue leading up to an election the u.s courts are going to be the ones to decide whether you're allowed to exercise that first All amendment right or not hold on you keep you're talking a lot okay i just i agree with you that we might not truth i agree <laughs> no um yes ignoring the existence of an apparatus to make that measurement that existed in fact that's why that is they were challenging that system so, why, wait, so, okay, hold on. I, I don't, I, I don't understand why you're pretending like it's such an easy test to figure out. Like, oh, well, we have this boom, 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 and now we can decide. This is going to yes. be something that's going to be argued. It's like a, it's like fair use. This is going to be something that's going to be argued in front of a court every single time it comes up. The incentive is going to be there for people to take something. You can't do that. You guys haven't made enough of these films, or your films have all been propaganda, or you guys got funding from this conservative person. You're not a media company. You're just a propaganda outlet. Like these kinds of accusations are already made between super packs and packs. Now I had to play that long clip in full because Stephen actually hits the nail on the head really well, and he gets into the exact reasoning put forward by the court on why they ruled on the McCain-Feingold issue as a whole, rather than just ruling that Citizens United qualified under a media exemption, which as we talked about earlier, is arbitrary and capricious in the first place, thus protecting their right to advertise the Hillary documentary in the lead up to the Democratic primaries. Because if you think about it, Citizens United is a perfect example of the phenomenon that the court sought to prevent going forward. The case was decided in 2010. Obama talked about it in his State of the Union. He criticized the court for it in that year. But the thing is, the issue at hand was the Democratic primary, and the Democratic primary was taking place in 2007-2008. Now, to give you an example to emphasize this point, let's shift to discrimination law. Let's say I apply to university, and this university accepts me into the school. However, they have a policy against admitting Hispanics. Now, I'm half Puerto Rican, so technically I would qualify under the Hispanics. So I want relief from their policy in the court and the court has ruled sketchily in the past on this issue so instead of arguing that their policy is discriminatory therefore unconstitutional i bring to the court this idea that I shouldn't qualify as a Hispanic by the standards of the university because I don't speak Spanish, it's only a partial Hispanic heritage, whatever, whatever. Now, the reason I'm arguing this point is because I just want to get into university and I only have a limited time window in order to get in, study, etc., etc. However, what ultimately ends up happening is the lower courts rule against my argument. So it goes all the way up to the Supreme Court. And by the way, three years of time have passed by. Now, during the course of that three-year period, because I've been kept out of the university this whole time, I've actually already applied and accepted and taken courses, and I'm on the verge of completing my degree at another university. Now, Sam Cedar would say that the court should just rule narrowly that I don't qualify as a Hispanic because that's what I asked about and say that I should have been admitted to the university. Now, while the court could do that, it doesn't really resolve the issue because it's not like I can pull out my time dilation accelerator and go back three years and then bring them that ruling and then get into that university. Also, it doesn't prevent these questions from being brought up to the court 
in the future, which is something that they can foresee as a problem. It makes way more sense, especially if the court believes this to be true, especially with time sensitive issues like this, for them to rule that the entire discrimination policy is a violation of the 14th Amendment and therefore should be struck down in its entirety. This resolves the issue going forward forever. So regardless of the fact that the Supreme Court would have ultimately sided with Citizens United ruling that they could advertise the way that they did or the ruling that they could do the on-demand service the way that they did, effectively their freedom of speech in the lead up to the election was stifled by the court proceedings, by the FEC. And going forward, if you just ruled that Citizens United technically qualified as a media corporation, again an exemption that makes no sense, it's arbitrary and capricious, you would end up in a situation where the FEC could act in the same way and have the same effect and even if it's resolved later the idea is you can perpetually limit speech ahead of an election as Justice Kennedy said in his decision himself and I will quote from it the first amendment does not permit laws that force speakers to retain a campaign finance attorney conduct demographic marketing research or seek declaratory rulings before discussing the most important or salient political issues of our day. Now, I understand a lot of you have been propagandized against the Citizens United decision. You have your opinions. It's one of the most unpopular cases in American history. But if you think about what Justice Kennedy is fundamentally saying, you cannot argue that it is in fact true. The idea that the First Amendment permits the government to make you have to go to court to ask permission to speak on the political issues right before an election cycle every single time, and those court proceedings can delay you years until after after that election cycle, so even if you're right, you still are not able to speak, means we would have no First Amendment at all. That was the issue at hand. That's why the court couldn't just rule based on the narrow constraints of this. And the idea that you would get on board for these restrictions on speech because it prevents the restrictions from taking effect on established media corporations, thus granting them special privileges and immunities under law in regards to speech, makes no sense. I mean, do you really think that you can argue to me or to the American people or to a First Amendment scholar that somehow the Disney Corporation, Paramount, 20th Century Fox, the New York Times, the Washington Post, any of these other established outlets all of a sudden have nobler agendas or should be protected in advocating for their agendas, but nonprofits, individuals, unions, and other corporations that don't have established media interests somehow shouldn't be. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't stand up to scrutiny, which is why the court definitely was correct in ruling the way that they did. What Sam Cedar is arguing for is effectively a system where everybody has to demand pre-clearance from the Supreme Court or from the appellate courts in order to speak about elections, except for those established interests, one of which he happens to be a contributor to MSNBC. And my point is, you can argue that there is no way for the law to determine, uh, you know, any type of application as to whether something qualifies as one thing or another. It happens every single day all across the country by millions of, not millions, by, by tens of agencies across the country. So while some of you might be able to argue that Sam Cedar throughout the course of this conversation was able to convince Destiny's audience that Destiny framed his knowledge of Citizens United as inaccurate, in reality, through the course of this conversation, you saw that Sam Cedar does not stand up for First Amendment values. He believes in special privileges for some corporations instead of other corporations based on the fact that those corporations did enough in media, established themselves enough rather than you grassroots plebs that want to interact with politics before an election. He ended up undercutting his case while showing that even talking about this for years hasn't allowed him to put forward better arguments for why McCain-Feingold, which was seen as unconstitutional as soon as it was proposed, made any sense as a law regulating the speech of individuals in the lead up to an election. So again, cheers to Destiny for bringing Sam Cedar on, for arguing with him even when not prepared and getting him to twist himself into to a bunch and getting him so mad about comments about male bodily fluids that he freaked out and repeated it over and over again throughout the course of the stream. I will be using those clips for a compilation right now. You said that I would be guzzling buckets of his cum if he was black and they were white. I, and, yeah, true. Okay, so, so uh -huh. now, 
aside from you know the issue of whether I would guzzle buckets of cum in any scenario, mm-hmm. said I would be guzzling buckets of his cum. That I'm assuming is your way of saying I'd be celebrating that person, right? <clears throat> like, not celebrating, but I think so be... excited that I would be guzzling buckets of their cum. I think that I the... would let them jack off in my mouth because I'm so excited about what they did. And I'm telling you, I've never done that. That a hypothetical situation where I'd be so excited, I'd be jizzling, you know, giz- you know, uh, sucking people's cum. But you pretended. You came up with a hypothetical accusing me if it was a different race that I would be so ecstatic about it, I would be guzzling their buckets of cum. Anyway, those are just my thoughts. So let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. If you liked this video, you could show them by leaving a like. You could subscribe for more content. Follow me on all my social medias. You could support me via the support links in the description box of this video. This has been me talking about Destiny crushing Sam Cedar on Citizens United. Till next time.